very much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, so I'm a PhD student um, down here in Auckland, New Zealand, and um, I'm part-time, so I've been going for a very long time, um, but I promise I will finish um, at some point. Um, I think the university really would like me to. Um, so today I thought I would um, talk in general about my approach and some of the decisions that I've made along the way, um, and then talk a bit about where I'm at now. Um, obviously, some some of it's still a little fuzzy in my head, so I'm still kind of thinking thinking about it all. Um, so obviously any comments or thoughts you have are um, most appreciated. Um, so the focus of my research is um, an exploration of the role of physical objects and phenomena in the Egyptian Logos. So this constitutes book two and the very beginning of book three up to chapter 37. I'm focusing specifically on the elements that Herodotus uses to describe physical things, both objects and phenomena. My interest is not only in how they function within um, his, his historical method, but also how else they might function. Um, firstly, though, I'll just cover off a few things about my approach. So I'm treating Herodotus's method as a constructed method. This is how Herodotus thinks Historia works, and he presents that method within the histories. My research focuses on the physical objects or phenomena in his, his, his historical method, how he describes them, and how this may contribute to the overall purpose of the histories. Uh, the focus then is not on veracity, but on function and presentation, specifically the evidentiary value and the visual impact of the physical things. Uh, objects or phenomena which appear only as part of the narrative of the story, of a story that Herodotus relates, are excluded from consideration. Um, how he utilises those objects within the narratives may indicate his possible attitude towards sight and objects as a source of historical information. However, they can function quite differently to the ones, the objects that he mentions as part of his um, inquiry. Um, they may advance the narrative action, for instance, uh, or provide a means to display a deeper meaning within the story. Before I move on to my methodology, I'll quickly cover the source citations in the Egyptian Logos. Um, there are certain complexities that come with the wealth of information we are given about the sources of Herodotus's information. There are, of course, the three broad source statements given in the Logos at chapters 29, 99, and 147, as shown on the slide. These statements are certainly useful as they give us Herodotus's sources and which parts of book two they cover. We know that he used sight, heard information, inquiry, and reasoning. We also know that some figured more prominently in certain parts of the book than others. So sight figures more in the earlier part of the book on the geographic matters, whereas heard information becomes more prominent in the historical section. All sources are present, but their level of use changes. The problem though, is that these statements do not provide specific source information for each object or phenomena described. All we end up with is the assumption that Herodotus could claim to have seen any of the objects as they are all covered by these statements. This does not account for the objects and phenomena that do come with a direct claim of sight by Herodotus. The question arises as to why he would claim to claim direct sight for some and not others if they were in fact all seen. There is also a difference between seeing something for oneself and noting the existence of something. Just as we could assume Herodotus saw all the, visual, the physical objects and phenomena mentioned in book two due to the source statements, we could also assume that Herodotus used heard information of the existence of an object or phenomena without having seen it himself by using the individual source statement given or not for that object or phenomena. An examination of the individual source statements for physical objects and phenomena does not make the situation any clearer. There are certainly some objects and phenomena which Herodotus claims to have seen himself, and this is denoted by the presence of a verb of seeing or a clear statement that it was autopsy. These cases of direct optus can be found throughout the Logos. Considering though the large number of physical things in this Logos, Herodotus does not claim to have directly seen that many. There are only 17 instances of direct sight being claimed out of the 87 physical things I have identified. In addition to these uh, direct claims of sight, there are a small group of physical objects where, while they have no source information given for them, a claim to sight could be inferred. Some of these objects are in close physical proximity to those Herodotus does claim to have seen, and others are given information for their location in Herodotus's time. Both of these features mean that a claim to autopsy could be inferred in the text, though it can only ever be an inference. There are also many physical objects and phenomena for which no source citation is given. There is no verb of seeing, no statements that could infer that sight was possible. 
These objects and phenomena are, however, associated with a story or a judgment that Herodotus is relating that do have a stated source. And this is usually either heard information or reasoning. This group of objects and phenomena is problematic. Is the source of the object the same as the source for the story or the judgment? Or is its source assumed to be the broad source statement that governs it? So either chapter 99, 29 or 147. In which case there could be an inferred claim of direct sight. Heard information and reasoning as sources do not infer sight, but nor do they rule it out. Wherever inquiry is indicated, we know some kind of process has occurred and there are many ways in which this process could include sight. Herodotus could have seen an object or phenomenon and asked about it, um, or asked about something and been shown an object or phenomena. However, he could also have asked about something without having seen or been shown anything. Again, sight cannot necessarily be inferred, but it also cannot be ruled out. Finally, there are many objects and phenomena where no source is given for the object or phenomena or the story or judgment they are associated with. Most of these appear in the last part um, of the historical section of book two, which covers the more recent period of Egyptian history up to the Persian occupation. There is no way to determine what Herodotus is claiming here and the source statements at 29, 99 and 147 provide only an inference of what the source could be. Um, often for this section, it is generally thought that the source is Egyptian and Greek oral accounts. This did make the situation a little difficult for me as we don't really have a clear picture of what Herodotus is claiming to have seen. Apart from the objects and phenomena that come with the direct verb of seeing, we have only the assumptions we make ourselves about what he is claiming based on the source statements and the individual citations. If an examination of physical objects and phenomena is limited to only those that have a direct verb of seeing associated with them, there is a risk that the purpose and function of all these physical things will be missed. So the alternative approach I've taken is to examine all physical things, whether they are claimed to be seen or not, as they exist as things that can be accessed by the sense of sight. Whether Herodotus actually saw them or not, he has chosen to present them in a certain way and provides a wealth of descriptive information about them. So by way of a quick summary of my methodology, the first task was to identify all the instances in the Egyptian Logos where Herodotus refers to physical objects or phenomena as part of his historical inquiry and describes them. The physical objects and phenomena I've identified were then grouped and defined. <coughs> These categories aim to bring together physical objects and phenomena which are described in similar ways. Each category then will have its own set of descriptive elements, elements of their physical appearance which Herodotus uses, to, uses in his descriptions. So the categories are there on the slide, um, natural phenomena. I then had to break this down into subcategories of geographical, geological phenomena, fauna and flora, um, really just because they're all uh, natural phenomena, but they, have, they will have different descriptive elements. So they are a category uh, in, their, in their own way. Um, secondly, custom and culture. So any observation of people and their customs, so origins, appearance, how they live, practices, all that kind of thing. Uh, monuments and man-made objects, so any man-made structures and art, and this includes temples and sculptures, as well as pyramids, labyrinths, that sort of thing. Um, and then finally, the written word, so any source Herodotus presents is written down, so any of the papyri he mentions or the inscriptions that appear on objects. So then I went on and described, uh, identified all the descriptive elements for each category, um, so a lot of tables um, ended up being <laughs> Uh, created to do this. So a couple of examples. So for instance, for natural phenomena, fauna, basically it's physical appearance, behavior, breeding habits, burial practices, and um, their sacred status. And for man-made objects, um, tends to be location, shape, size, what it's made of, how it's made, when it was made, made by who, any specific design features, and then occasionally we'll get some more descriptors, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Uh, and so on for the other categories. What I hope to show is that while Herodotus presented historical, presented historical method did rely on sight as a source, the descriptive elements given for physical things were not always essential to an object's uh, value as evidence. In fact, physical objects and phenomena often require other sources to be used for the evidentiary value to be realized. I will also hope to show that physical objects and phenomena performed other functions within the histories that did rely on their physical description as well as other sources. 
This visual impact is central to Herodotus' presentation, not only of Egypt, but also the known world at the time. Finally, I hope to argue that physical objects and phenomena in the Egyptian Logos contribute to the histories in a far greater way than just as evidence or the description of a foreign place and culture. Herodotus' presentation of Egypt was deliberately crafted not only to leave his Greek audience with a particular view of Egypt and its place within the history of the Persian Wars, but to also fulfill the purpose of the histories as a whole. The descriptive elements, however, themselves also present some complexity. They are definitely identifiable, however, they are not applied consistently, or at least not in a way I've been able to find. So as an example, I put a, one of the tables up there on the slide. For the animals of Egypt, Herodotus describes their physical appearance, behavior, breeding habits, burial practices, and an explanation of where and or why they are sacred. Um, however, we don't get all these descriptive elements for every animal. So as you can see on the table, we're only getting sort of, I think only the crocodile has all five of those um, descriptors given. And there could be various explanations for this. Um, things that would have been familiar to his Greek audience may not have necessarily needed a high level of description. So for example, Herodotus probably didn't need to describe the physical appearance of a cat to his Greek audience, but he does give their behavior, breeding habits and bur burial practices uh, because they were different um, in Egypt. So it could be about his audience. It could also be that he had incomplete information from his sources. Um, and if he used written material or oral, oral reports, he may simply be presenting uh, what he had. Uh, despite this though, there, uh, there are general areas of focus for, for Herodotus in each category. So I'll just quickly work through that. So under natural phenomena for geography and geology, uh, this focuses on the nature of the land and the extent of the country um, with a large focus obviously on the Nile River. So its course, its source and its nature. Um, descriptive elements focus on how the land has changed because of the uh, action of the Nile, as well as um, a lot of time and distance measures to demonstrate the size and boundaries of, of Egypt. Um, there is also some description of the way the land looks. For fauna, as I've described, we've got physical appearance, um, behavior, breeding habits, burial practices, and sacred status. For flora, there are only a few examples, and the descriptions of these um, plants tend to focus on how they're used for food, particularly in the marsh regions of Egypt. Um, but there is some physical description of what they look like. Um, Custom and culture, um, there's only a brief mention really of Egyptian people's physical appearance and their clothing. Uh, and the focus is primarily on their customs and way of life. Um, generally, descriptions can be grouped into appearance, lifestyle, religious practices, funeral practices, um, and also inventions that have come from the Egyptian people. For monuments and man-made objects, as mentioned above, typically we get location, the shape of the monument, the size, what it's made of, how it was made, when it was made, made by who, this is generally the king that commissioned it, um, any design features that are um, impressive in any way, and also some other descriptors sometimes of um, a more general appearance of the item. And I'll talk a little bit more about those a bit later. Again, though, it's inconsistent. So some monuments have most of them and some have very few. So there's about 57 monuments or man-made objects. Um, 45 of them are given a location and 41 have a king associated with them. Um, 24 are given a size and 26 are given the material they're made of. Um, the least given factors are how the monument was constructed uh, and when, so we don't always often get those ones. The fullest example of a monument is Cheops's Pyramid at chapter 124, 125. And finally, the written word. So there um, are a few papyri that Herodotus refers to. Um, and there are five inscriptions that he notes uh, on objects. Um, only one of those actually includes how it's placed on the monument. All the others are just um, noted, uh, but all are given a translation. So despite this apparent lack of consistent application of the descriptive elements, there are still discernible themes that become clear, especially when all physical objects are considered together. Um, these physical objects appear to have two main functions, their use as evidence and their use as a presentation of Egypt. So um, we'll look at the evidentiary value first. So by evidentiary value, I mean when Herodotus uses a physical thing to pro provide proof of a person, event, story, or theory, the physical thing, thing then has evidentiary value. 
This value helps Herodotus to display his method. Physical things are part of the toolkit. And there are various ways that we can see this appear. One of the obvious ways is that physical objects remain as a, as a physical thing of the, of the historical period he's talking about. This is seen most prominently in the many monuments Herodotus describes as part of the historical section of the Egyptian Logos. So basically from chapter 99 onwards. Many of the monuments mentioned are linked to a king, as I said before, and often come with a story about that king. And sometimes Herodotus will make a judgment about that story. Uh, and this all provides a physical marker of that king's reign. But there is a really complex dynamic between object, story, and judgment throughout this section of the Logos. And there are many combinations of the three. So sometimes we'll have an object with no story and no judgment. Sometimes we'll have a story with no object and no judgment. Sometimes we have an object that does have a story associated with it, but no judgment. Sometimes we have an object, a story, and a judgment. And then other times we'll have a story, no object, and a judgment. So the key to the complexity of that is that it all appears to be a balancing act for Herodotus. Physical objects are not essential to Herodotus telling a story or making a judgment on a story. They can be, but they don't have to be. There are also objects that do not have stories or judgments associated with them, but they are mentioned anyway. What is also interesting is that what is required of a physical thing to be useful with evidence also varies. In some cases, its existence is enough, in others, something of its physical appearance is essential. There are clear incidences when something we are told about a thing's physical appearance is central to its use as evidence. Um, so one example of this would be the soil in Egypt at chapter 12. Um, Herodotus is arguing that the land of Egypt is a gift of the river, um, the soil being deposited by the Nile as it flows into the sea. This accounts for why Egypt projects into the sea. One piece of evidence is what the soil looks like in comparison to the soil found in Libya, Arabia, and Syria. Egypt's soil is black and crumbling, showing it is clearly soil deposited from the Nile. The color and consistency are very important factors in this physical thing being used as evidence. We see this again in the 20 statues, statues Herodotus mentions in, in conjunction with uh, Missoniris. Herodotus is told by the priests of Sais that these statues represent concubines who had their hands cut off for allowing the king to lay with his own daughter. Herodotus states that apart from the story he was told, he cannot actually say who the statues represent. But Herodotus does make a judgment that the story is nonsense as he saw himself that the hands had fallen off the statues over time and were evident on the floor in his own day. The attribute of the physical thing is central to Herodotus choosing to disbelieve the priest's story. There are others, however, where descriptive elements are not important to the physical thing having an evidentiary value. So one example can be found in his extend, extended discussion on the theory that Helen resided in Egypt for the duration of the Trojan War. He supports this theory and provides an extensive amount of evidence for this. Sight, heard information and reasoning all feature here, combining to prove his point. There are two physical things used here, a temple to the foreign or stranger Aphrodite and a temple to Heracles. There are no descriptive elements given for these uh, objects apart from that they are temples. Um, and what makes them both useful as evidence is something Herodotus has actually told about them. So the name of the first temple and the custom practiced at the second temple. Their appearance is not needed for them to be useful as evidence, just that they exist. Uh, and this is seen again further uh, earlier on in the book um, when Herodotus talks about the Temple of Heracles that he visits at chapter 44. So he's trying to prove there are two Heracles as an Egyptian god and a Greek hero. Part of his proof is trips he has made to view some temples in Tyre and Thasos. While we get some physical description of one of the temples in Tyre, it's the age of the temples that really make them valuable. This information is given to Herodotus by the priests. The temple is too old to possibly be for a Greek hero, so clearly it's to an ancient god, and therefore there are in fact two Heracleses. Um, so just as physical evidence is not required for Herodotus to make a judgment about something, what makes physical things useful as evidence is not always its appearance. Sometimes existence is enough. While we do get some objects that appear alone and that they don't have a story or a judgment associated with them, in the majority of cases, sight and heard information as sources are represented together. The object informs the story, the story informs the object. 
physical evidence on his own on its own is not always enough and in some cases for the physical thing to be used as evidence it required heard on heard information alongside it so for example when we hear the story of sethos and we're told about the statue of the king holding a mouse the story and the statue become entwined the story gives meaning to the statue the statue remains as a monument to the event in the present objects are not able to convey all meaning required simply by their presence and their appearance there are also cases where physical things appear with reasoning the fullest example of this is herodotus's investigation of the nile flood not much physical evidence is used here although he does use some when he disputes the three greek theories that are put forward and his conclusion comes most solely almost solely from reasoning and we can see this again when he talks about the course of the nile uh, when he argues the nile ister uh, relationship and also when he's arguing um, for helen's uh, time in egypt where he argues from what is most likely Herodotus is comfortable with making decisions with varying types and amounts of evidence. And finally, the last point here is that while physical objects can remain in the present as a reminder of the past, they themselves can still be victim to the passage of time. So this idea should be linked to Herodotus' purpose in writing the histories itself. They help to provide the physical evidence for the memorial he was creating and in so doing are memorialized themselves. However, these objects are not able to convey all the meaning required simply by their presence and appearance. They are what is left, but they are given meaning most often by what is said. I'll now talk a little bit about the visual impact. So by visual impact, I mean when Herodotus uses a thing's physical traits to contribute to a constructive presentation of a time or place or thing. Um, this is visible in certain ways. So the physical objects and phenomena Herodotus describes do have an evidentiary value. By their presence, they show the existence of kings, where people lived, and how land looked. The memorializing function, though, requires more than just the presence of physical things to fulfill its purpose. The visual impact of the descriptions of the monuments, the culture, and the landscape leave not only proof of something's existence, but also a presentation of people and places at certain points in time. The description of the road constructed to enable the building of Cheops's pyramid not only signifies the erga of the king, but also something of the nature of his reign. This road and pyramid is also a memorial to the labor the Egyptian people had to undertake to build it. But like evidentiary value, the visual impact requires the story of the construction along with it and Cheops's later treatment of his own daughter, for which another smaller pyramid remains as memorial. The papyrus of 330 monarchs uh, that Herodotus refers to comes to signify a lack of events or achievements by all these kings except for two. So Herodotus only mentions two um, of any note out of those 330. So the papyrus actually is all that remains of those, of the, those kings' reigns is, is the papyrus. There's nothing else to say or nothing else left. Uh, and of course, the people are memorialized as well, how they live, how they die, how they differ from the Greeks, how they differ from each other. And they are presented as they are in Herodotus's time when he could or uh, didn't travel to Egypt. The landscape is also memorialized, but different from the people, it's memorialized in the past and the present. So how it was and how it is now. So the, the way the landscape change, has changed over time and how Herodotus can de detect that change is reflected in those descriptive elements. There is also a sense of change throughout, um, throughout the Egyptian logos. The physical things mentioned are used to express this constant force of change. So Herodotus's geographical descriptions demonstrates the sense of change over time. So landscapes change as you move through them. So for instance, Herodotus's description of the course of the Nile, the river is twisty for a time, then it levels out into a flat plain. Landscapes also change shape and nature over time. Herodotus's detailed description of the silting effect of the Nile postulates on how much this has changed the formation of the land over time. People always also change with those landscapes. They have different skin colors. They live in different ways. They have different practices. The sense of change in the landscape is, is not only expressed in the description of natural forces, but men also change the landscape as well. So Min's Dam redirects the Nile and dries out the land for Memphis. Lake Morris is man-made, fed by a channel from the Nile. The canals that were built by Sesostris dug 
uh, that bisect Egypt in Herodotus' time. Men could no longer use horses and carts, but it did mean that people living further from the Nile had better access to fresh water. So the Nile, while representing a continual change to the landscape of Egypt, can also be restrained and redirected to meet the needs of the kings of Egypt, which again changes the landscape and the way of life for the Egyptian people. Physical things can also demarcate space, provide locations and permanence. This is seen most notably in the way they can mark progress and the halt of that progress. So for example, Sesostratus' stelae that re um, remain mark the extent of his military expansion and indicate via carving some information about the nature of the battle that occurred there. However, some objects do not survive and others are also transportable. So even with Sesostratus' campaigns, Herodotus' judgment is reliant only on the stelae that remain and he tells us that many do not and can no longer be seen. Latakei's statue was made in Egypt and then sent to Cyrene where it still was in Herodotus's day. So some monuments do not provide the same permanency as others. So while Herodotus relies on the permanence of these physical things to a certain extent, his descriptions show that they are still subject to change over time. They also express this constant force. Physical objects and phenomena also show the change in fortune of Egypt's kings and its people. These objects embody the events that show this change in fortune and resonate with Herodotus' comment in the poem that prosperity never stays in one place forever. So Mycenaeus um, was a ju more just king than Cheops and Chephron, but he does suffer misfortune during his reign. So the wooden cow that he builds uh, to entomb his daughter symbolizes um, the death of his daughter and his deep grief. And his uh, smaller pyramid is in sharp relief against the larger ones left by Cheops and Kephron. Nus is a blind man who ruled Egypt until an Ethiopian king invaded, fled to the marshes where the Egyptian people fed and brought him ashes. The physical remains of his time in exile is an island of ashes called Albo, a mile long and a mile wide. This island at its remarkable size a physical reminder to this king's time in exile. The change in fortune of Egyptian people is also reflected by these monuments. Cheops and Kephron's reigns, while marked by large pyramids, also signify a change in fortune for the people. Uh, and while uh, Mycenaeus' smaller pyramid marks suffering for the king, it actually marks a better time for the Egyptian people, as he was a more just king. The visual impact of physical things can also be part of the expression of Herodotus' interest in causation. They help to explain how and why things happened. Physical things can often display some of the narrative action of the stories Herodotus hears. The skeletons of flying snakes he claims to have seen in a pass near Buto are the physical remains left by the action of the ibis bird eating the snakes as they fly through the pass. This is why the ibis is sacred in Egypt. The temple of Heracles in the Helen story remains to Herodotus' day and still practices the custom that allowed servants to escape and gave Proteus the opportunity to stop Helen reaching Troy. The statue of Sethos in the field mouse becomes a physical manifestation of the story it accompanies. And Sesotus' stelae, with their inscriptions and carvings, indicate the nature of the battle that occurred in that place. Physical things also help to explain why things look and behave the same or differently. This is seen largely in the geographical and ethnographical sections. The physical descriptions he provides allow the audience to understand not only how something appears, but also how it behaves. Herodotus can explain the alluvial nature of the land in Egypt by looking at the soil and noticing shells and sand in the mountains, proving the silting theory correct. This is why the Egyptians labor so little on their land in comparison to other people. Their soil is different and they are different. The Persian and Egyptian skulls Herodotus examines at a battle site look the same but behave differently. The Persian skulls are brittle, the Egyptian skulls are thick. Herodotus can explain this difference. Persians wear hats. Egyptians shave their heads. The Egyptian Logos is also a Logos of wonders. Herodotus commented that he will talk the most about Egypt because of the many wonders that are there. There is no doubt that this focus on wonders colors the entire Logos and the wondrous aspects of the physical world provide another visual impact to the objects and phenomena. However, the way Herodotus describes some objects and phenomena indicates that it was not as straightforward as concluding that they were all simply Thoma. There are indications that Herodotus is making quantitative and qualitative judgments about these wonders, so they may not all have been created equal. For example, the many monuments that are mentioned throughout the Logos have different levels of description. So 
one type have very little description of their physical attributes, but are often fairly important for uh, evidence that Herodotus is using to make a point. So the Temple of Heracles, for example, will be one example. These objects have an evidentiary value, but it doesn't rest on their appearance and they aren't given much physical uh, description. The second type of objects are those that receive some description of their physical attributes, and typically these attributes are ones such as size, shape, what they're built of, how they're built. These objects are normally introduced as being built by a particular king and have evidentiary value as well as visual impact as discussed earlier. These objects can res represent a complex pattern of values and perform multiple functions for, the, for Herodotus. So the evidence of the king, they're a memorial, they may express change over time or causation and so on. But there are no adjectives necessarily that describe an overall sense or judgment of their appearance. The final type of object is a group which receives much more extensive treatment in terms of physical description and are typ typically notable for some reason. So these objects are often described in terms of being worth seeing or are often, used, descri are often described using superlatives. So they tend to be the most of something or in some way. So examples of this would be the temple at Bubastis, the labyrinth and Lake Morris. Herodotus's heightened treatment of them certainly sets them apart from the other monuments above. So I'm still working out what this heightened treatment might mean, um, and I'm currently further analysing the monuments which fall into the third type that I described above. They are interesting, I think, because they are not always tied to a king, so not necessarily the ergo of a king, which most other, other monuments are. Um, then most of the time not proving anything either, so there isn't necessarily a, a sort of judgment um, relationship going on there. Um, and the descriptive elements um, focus more on, on something that they are the most of. So all their comparative, comparative standing to other wonders or Greek examples. So is it a quantitative judgment, a qualitative ju judgment or both? Um, and some have no physical description other than just that they are worth looking at. And we're not given any detail about what is worth looking at about them. Um, and we also get other kinds of adjectives that are not necessarily superlatives or, or, or comparatives. So things like it's called pleasing or it's well made. Um, and this is, of course, isn't limited just to monuments. So the landscape and the people of Egypt are also presented in this way as being the best or most or first. So the, the Nile is a good example in the natural world in terms of its size and its behaviour and the effect it has on the land and the people. And the Egyptian people themselves are sort of the first in a lot of ways. They're religious beyond measure, they're the healthiest, um, they're the best at preserving the past, uh, and they invent things. Um, so I'm not exactly sure where I'm going here, but there is a difference, and in some way, in the way these things are described, which I think is worth looking at further. So to summarise this part, every physical thing in some way, to some extent, has a visual impact. And because the Egyptian logos is so long, it's extremely prominent here. These physical things and their descriptive elements allow Herodotus to construct a presentation of a time and place, which then helps to memorialize it and explain it. So how does this relate to the histories as a whole? To establish this, of course, we must go back to the proem um, and have a look at the purposes that Herodotus gives us for the work. So obviously it's a display of his method um, and he's doing this so that things are not forgotten over time and deeds are not uncelebrated. Uh, and he also is interested in why the Greeks and Persians fought each other. And he'll tell the story of both small and large cities alike, because prosperity never stays in the same place. So essentially, it's a method, and it's a memorial made possible by that method. It's glory retained via, via the memorial made possible by the method. It's about causation, how, why things happen and it's to tell the stories of all. And this is important because of the rise and fall in fortune. The evidentiary value and visual Im impact of physical things express these purposes in the following way. Physical things are part of the method, evidentiary value beyond a lifetime and evident through space and time. Physical things act as a memorial to the people and events of the past and signify their glory. Physical things reflect change over time, location, demarcation, movement, how it was, how it is. Physical things reflect the why of things, how things happened, why they happened, why they are, how they are. Physical things also describe a people and a place in the past and present and show the change in fortune of countries, cities and people. So in summary, the evidentiary value of physical things in the history is not disputed, rather the veracity of the things themselves is questioned. However, we can say, what we can say is that Herodotus presents physical things as part of his inquiry. I would argue that despite the actual truth of these things, the method presented to us in the histories 
is one that saw the value in what is left and its relationship to what is said. Whether Herodotus actually traveled or not, whether he saw these things or not, he presents his inquiry to his audience as completed in this way. Seeing and inquiring about material things matters, and this is one way you can find out about the past. The visual impact of physical things when considered in reference to the many descriptive elements Herodotus gives us in the Egyptian Logos presents another expression of the purpose of the histories. These descriptive elements are not always required for physical things to work as evidence, but their visual impact is conveyed by Herodotus uh, by these elements. Visual impact is built up over the course of the Egyptian Logos to not only present his method and a picture of Egypt, but to also fulfill the purpose of the histories. I come to think of Herodotus's activity to be like weaving. He, he has strands that must be woven together and balanced out before a full picture can emerge for his audience. Sometimes strands are missing, other times strands are thicker and stronger than others. The picture is sometimes incomplete. Herodotus's method is, as constructor, draws on multiple sources to provide a presentation of the past and his own present. These strands like strands of flax, these sources like strands of flax are woven together to form a picture and not just any picture, but the picture Herodotus wanted his audience to see. Thank you.